So let us talk about postcolonialism in the novel in the modern world. In discussing postcolonialism and its application to the novel in the modern world, we will look at Anita Desai in Custody, published in 19. 84. But before we go into the, the discussion of the novel, it's important that we consider what postcolonialism is all about. Specifically, I intend that we should study the terms that are usually discussed in postcolonialism, key terms in the discussion of postcolonialism. So the first thing that I want to talk about is ambivalence. Please note that when you are discussing postcolonialism, <clears throat> you need to be specific of the strand or thoughts or ideology. that you are anchoring your work on. Because postcolonialism is very wide in scope and contains so many thoughts, ideologies, that if you just use the term without specifying, then we'll find it difficult to know exactly what you're talking about. So, to begin with, we normally use the term postcolonialism to describe the arts ideology in previously colonized territories, the perception of life, the worldview of the people in previously colonized spaces. So when we talk about postcolonial literature, we refer to the literature of colonized people. And it is necessary to talk about or to discuss the literature of these spaces from the perspective of postcolonialism, because postcolonialism in phase the continuous effects of colonialism on the people who were colonized. The fact that their culture was irre irre irreversibly altered by the incident of colonialism. This means that when you look at the previously colonized people and their lives, you could still find traces of colonialism in how they live, in the, the way they dress, in their language, and in their culture. And this is part of the reason why postcolonial study continues to be relevant. So in talking about postcolonialism, you can talk about it in terms of how the culture of the colonized people is a reflection of the incident of colonialism. You can discuss it from the perspective of of Neocolonialism, 
neocolonialism, which refers to a new form of colonialism, this time not perpetrated by uh, the white people alone, but in collaboration with the new African leaders who continue from where the colonial masters stopped. Neocolonialism could also be used to talk about how the former colonial masters continue to have influence, political influence, economic influence in formerly colonized spaces through the institutions that they left behind, through the structures that they put in place before they left the post colony. And we will see other perspectives of postcolonial study in the terms that we want to um, look at. The idea that when we are talking about postcolonialism, we are talking about an era after the colonial experience is not always true. It depends on how you want to look at it. Okay? Because for Ashcroft et al., for Ashcroft et al., um, postcolonialism is a term that's used to describe the experiences of the colonized beginning from the colonial era up to this moment. That's how Ashcroft et al. in the Empire Rights Back define postcolonialism. So it's not always that when you, the term postcolonialism is used, it infers the aftermath of colonialism or the period after colonial rule. No. For Ashcroft, for, um, for instance, postcolonialism is a term that could be used to describe the experiences of the colonial, uh, the experiences of the colonized right from the moment of the colonial encounter up till this moment um, in history. So most of the time, most of the time you need to define your terms, you need to know exactly what you are talking about, you need to know the aspect of postcolonialism that you are using and how it suits your, the text that you are applying it to. So let us, apart from neocolonialism that we have talked about, which I believe it is, uh, um, is um, a term that you're familiar with, we can also talk about ambivalence as a postcolonial term, because it is these terms that will help you to uh, make a meaningful analysis of any postcolonial text. You cannot pick up a postcolonial text and you begin to tell stories when there are terms and issues that you can um, use to discuss those uh, texts. Okay, so ambivalence is a term um, used to discuss the relationship of the colonizer and the colonized. Ambivalence is a term used to discuss the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized and how they perceive of one another. It's a term used to describe the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized and how they perceive of one another. For instance, um, ambivalence is usually marked by contrariness and a little bit of dialecticality. Uh, ambivalence is marked by confusion, marked by dilemma, and marked by dialecticality. For instance, the colonizer might look at the colonized at once 
as inferior and as exotic. As inferior and as exotic. Okay? In relation to the colonize to the colonizer, the colonize is inferior. But because the because the colonize is also exotic other, also the exotic other, the colonizer finds him fascinating. Okay? Finds him fascinating, an object to behold, perhaps a plaything, perhaps a fun thing. Inferior yet admired, cared for, looked after. For instance, like we know that the monkey is an animal, but then you like to keep it as a pet. So that is the, the idea of benevolence, okay? Which is undefined, which is which is a state of being undefined, instead of at once having two. Um, perception about a particular thing. On the other hand, the, the colonized will look at the colonizer as an object of envy, that which is to be envied because of his ex exalted position. Because of his exalted position, But at the same time, sees them as, sees the colonizers as what? As corrupt, evil, oppressors. So you could see the ambivalence in that relationship. Okay? The colonizer is admired, but at the same time, hated. That's what we mean by ambivalence. The colonized is looked down upon, but at the same time cannot be ignored, has to be cared for. Okay? Then we have hegemony. Hegemony is a term in postcolonial study. And it is used to study dominance. Hegemony is a term that is marked by dominance. Control. It involves power politics or power play, where one group controls the other, where one con we discuss is. where one discusses higher than the other or more dominant compared to the another discourse. So hegemony refers to power dominance or leadership dominance. Note that power dominance does not only occur at the level of human beings. It also occurs at the level of discourses. And in postcolonialism, discourses are fields of power. Okay? In postcolonialism, discourses are fields of power. So the, colonial, the colonialist ideology is usually hegemonic. The colonialist ideology, usually hegemonic, seem to be more powerful and more dominant. So at the level of discourse, the level of discourse, the postcolonial ideology is a grand narrative or a meta narrative. And that is the hegemonic discourse. These are postcolonial terms, and this is how you discuss postcolonialism. We do not want stories. We want you to pick the text, 
and discuss the text based on these terms where applicable. Alienation. Alienation is usually described using two terms. Alienation is usually described using two terms. Alienation is usually described using two terms. And these are place and displacement. Place and displacement. Place and displacement. The postcolonial subject experiences alienation. And this alienation is mostly cultural and psychological. This notion is mostly cultural and psychological. The personal su subject is ab uprooted from his culture. The personal subject is uprooted from his culture. Even if he is living in his own land, even when he's living even when the subject is living in his own land. Because he's no longer practicing his culture. So that is what we might call cultural alienation. He is, even when he is at home, he is not at home. Okay? He is culturally displaced. He doesn't need to leave the home state in order to be culturally displaced. As long as he is not imbibing his culture or not, has not found the structures of the culture there, the personnel, uh, the personnel subject is alienated. He seems to have experienced alienation. And this alienation is mostly a psychological thing. So to be displaced is not only to, to leave home, which, is of, which of course is the lot of the postcolonial subject. They don't usually feel at home, okay? They don't usually feel at home. But even when they are home, one can still be alienated when one is not practicing one's cultural values. So the postcolonial subject is a displaced subject. The postcolonial subject is a displaced subject. Is a displaced person. He's psychologically displaced. Sometimes this displacement can take a physical nature, right? But most times, the displacement should be understood psychologically. Hybridity. Hybridity. Now, note that you can use each of these terms to study a postcolonial text, to do a full study of a postcolonial text. Just one of them. You can say, I want to study ambivalence in this text. I want to study hybridity in this text. And you do a full study of it. So ability is taken from biology. It's a term taken from biology. Remember that um, criticism appropriates terms from different fields. It is in um, criticism that we appropriate terms from different fields of study. So originally ability is a term taken from um, 
biology, especially in crossbreeding, the notes crossbreeding. where elements from two different species are brought together to produce something new. For instance, you can, you can take, you can crossbreed, you can crossbreed American goat with an African goat to have a new species of goat that has never been before. Okay? And what will result of, in that is a hybrid that is not pure, not made from one stock or from one gene. Okay? So ability is synonymous with impurity, biological impurity. And the postcolonial subject, you must understand, is a hybrid. The postcolonial subject is a hybrid. The postcolonial subject is a hybrid. It's impure. Of course, we know there was a, um, we had we had this eugenic ideologies um, that tended to stop one race from um, interbreeding with another race, like um, in apartheid, because they wanted to maintain the purity of the races. This is negated in hybridity. And it becomes more interesting when ability is understood at the level of culture. It becomes more interesting when ability is understood at the level of culture because, um, you see, postcolonialism studies the culture of formerly colonized people. We are a sum of our cultural values. We are all a sum of our cultural values. And so when you look at society, you don't need to even study literature in order to know that we are hybrids. That hybridity operates in the text. So the postcolonial subject is made, is made up of different cultural values. The postcolonial subject is imbued with different cultural values. He is part African and part European. And we have two cultures living in the same person. That is what defines identity. So the postcolonial subject is impure, culturally speaking. The postcolonial subject is impure, culturally speaking. You can, you can study ability at the level of language, where the postcolonial subject is a bilingual. You can study ability at the level of language, where the postcolonial subject is a bilingual, or even a multilingual, speaks English, speaks the native language, speaks Yoruba to survive, speaks it deeply because it comes from Akwaibun. Speaks how to survive in the north. Speaks French because he needs to go to France to look for a job. So the personal, the personal subject cannot help but become a linguistic hybrid because, for one, he has to survive or has to move around, cannot stay one place. So as he moves from place to place, 
it takes in the linguistic codes of the environment. Okay? So you can study hybridity at any level, at the level of culture, at the level of language. And the hybrid subject is seen having two cultures in him, making him impure. That is, what he has is not purely from his own race, from his own ethnicity, from his own culture, but a mix, a salad of cultural values. Let's look at marginality. Marginality defines the position of the postcolonial subject. Marginality defines the position of the postcolonial subject. Marginality defines the position of the postcolonial subject. In the scheme of things, the position, position, the position of the postcolonial subject in the scheme of things. Marginality is marked by little or no relevance in the scheme of things, not occupying a central position in the scheme of things, little or no relevance in the scheme of things, not occupying a central position in the scheme of things. Having only a little space to explore. Having only a small space to explore. Being allocated only a small space in a discourse. Remember, you must not think of each of these terms without putting them into the postcolonial discourse. All right? For instance, if we have a book of 10 chapters, the marginality of the postcolonial subject will be seen in him being given half of one chapter. Being given attention in half of one chapter, not even a full chapter. Whereas the rest of the chapter is given today, today to the colonialist ideology. That's at the level of discourse. So the personal subject at that level will occupy a magical, a marginal space. So we're talking about margins here, right? Margins. Having a little space to occupy. So we have we also have cultural marginality. We also have marginality at the level of discourse. Cultural marginality is seen in how the personal subject's culture is not regarded. It's not dominant. At the level of discourse, whatever concerns the, the post-colony or the post-colonial subject is not given much attention. It's not given much attention. All right? So the, so the idea, marginality is marked by the idea of occupying margins. Marginality can, also, can even be seen in relation to the woman's positionality in the scheme of things. The woman is really seen to occupy the margins in, in a, any patriarchal discourse. So by now, most of these terms are diffused into other fields. So you can discuss otherness, you can discuss um, hybridity in other fields, apart from postcolonialism. But this, um, we, we situate them in postcolonial study at this particular time. So I just want you to understand that you can discuss postcolonialism uh, with technical terms as experts and not just telling stories. 
using postcolonial texts. So you have a lot of things to talk about. All right? So to occupy the margin means not to have enough space, not to be given enough space in any, in any discourse or any situation. Mimicry. Mimicry is the lot of the postcolonial subjects because mimicry is the lot of the postcolonial subjects because the postcolonial subject has the penchant to copy the culture of the colonized, or the, or the culture of the colonizer, has this penchant to copy the culture of the colonizer. Okay? Like immediately I look at most of you now, I see you trying to copy the culture of the colonizer from your hairstyle, from your dress, all right? It's now, it's, it's now um, that we have the coloniality that many people have played down on the need to copy the culture of the colonizer, all right? In those, in those early days, maybe in the 60s, any averagely educated person will always appear in suits, whether the sun is <laughs> now we're standing out the how um, hot the climate is, the weather is, the people always appear in suits, but it has to look like the colonial masters. Okay, we don't really have um, such situations again, but um, people um, still do it. Some people change the skin pigmentation because. They want to be like the colonial master. They want to be white. Some people burn the head. All right? With relaxers. And in uh, those machines, what do they call them? Dryers. Okay? And when in the 90s, when some women used to have um, problem with their scarf because... You know that was when uh, most of this, uh, most of them, most of these um, innovations were being made, and because it was new, there was really no professionalism. So most times, some women um, go home crying from the salon. All right, that's mimicry, trying to adapt to the colonizer's culture. And some people also used to cut their tongue trying to speak in English, the same thing. You want to speak exactly like the colonial master, all right? Which we call speaking through the nose, all right? And in the process, they will cut their tongue. So that's mimicry, a tendency to want to imbibe the colonizer's language and all the process that goes into it. So, um, we also do not know whether like, the fixing of the eyelashes is part of it, but I know that it, it has also caused some problems, like causing blindness, having to, to lose the eyes. It's also part of it. Then let us look at metropolis and the province. The metropolis and the province. All right, if you use all these terms when you are making your analysis, you'll be a wonderful student of postcolonialism and province. Provinciality. You must come across provinciality in in the discourse of postcolonial texts. All right. So the the metropolis is the city. Is the city is the urban space, an urban center, noted for civilization. 
and cultural sophistication. Is it for civilization and cultural sophistication? The province is the opposite of the metropolis. It is underdeveloped, it is rural in nature, it's underdeveloped. It's like a backyard to the metropolis. And so if I give you the colonizer and I give you the colonizer and I ask you to place them where they belong in the either in the metropolis or in the province, I hope you know where to place them. Nobody, nobody should even tell you the answer. Right? So in relation in, in in relation in the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized, the colonizer belongs to the metropolis and the colonized belongs to the province. The province lacks sophistication. It, it lacks the sophistication that the metropolis has. And the colonized belongs to the province and always aspires to be in the metropolis. All right? Most of you, if you are given a choice to live in your village or to live in Uyo, you choose Uyo. All right? Because the village is where uncivilized people stay. And you don't want to be uncivilized. All right? Sometimes you just go to the village um, at the end of year, during Christmas, all right, to show the village people how civilized, how educated, how highly placed you have become. To show them the new culture, the new fashion, the new English, all right? And then they will look at you with admiration, all right? They will worship you <laughs> in the village. Because in relation to you, they are in the province, but you come from the metropolis. All right? But let's forget that. Let us use that analogy to talk about the relationship between the colonizer and the colonizer in terms of their spaces, the spaces where they belong. All right? Because then London will be a metropolis, whereas Abuja will be a province. All right? Then London will be a metropolis. Are you always prefer to be in London compared to being in a Abuja? All right. So the colon the colonized longs to be in the metropolis. Okay, that's why nearly anybody um, grows up. The person wants to go to town, wants to go to the city, wants to go to Lagos, because that is where it is happening. Right? <laughs> that is where it is happening. The center of culture. All right. So, in, in the relation between the metropolis and the province, one one is sophisticated; the other is not. One is developed; the other is not. One is cultured; the other is not. Okay. But in postcolonial terms, we can always discuss them in terms of irony, depending on what we see in the text. Okay. Can always discuss them in terms of the ironic nature. All right, home and unhomeliness. Home and unhomeliness. Again, you can use each of these terminologies to study um, text. You can say home and, um, and homeliness in this text. So that you go specifically um, focus your study on something that you can um, really, really define and talk about. So as the, as the as the as this name suggests, as the term suggests, 
Harm and unhomeliness depict the psychological states of the postcolonial subject who does not feel at home. He does not feel at home. The postcolonial subject does not feel at home. Even when he is at home, he is not at home because he's not happy there. Okay? The personal subject is never happy at home, never feels at home. It's a psychological thing. The reason is that he has been displaced in his, um, from his culture. He has been displaced from his culture. Because the home state is no longer there. It's no longer there in the sense that it is not what it used to be. So it cannot be at home. This is not, this is Nigeria. You might call it home as much as you like, but there's no homeliness here anymore because this is not the original home that we have. We are living in a completely different cultural space. That's what we mean by unhomeliness. We're living in a completely different cultural space. Apart from that, there are many things that make it impossible for us to feel at home here. That's why if you are given any opportunity to leave the country, even to Niger Republic, you will definitely go. Right? You pick your bag the next day. Because you are not happy at home. Okay? It's only when you were children that you sing home sweet home, home sweet home. Because of mom's food. Alright? You only sang it because you remember mommy's food when you get home from school. Alright? That was what made the home sweet. If you are asked to sing home sweet home, when you know that Nigeria is supposed to be home, but it's not, you will not sing. Because there's no sweet, there's nothing sweet about the home. All right? So, unhomeliness is a psychological state of the post-colonial subject. Unhomeliness is the psychological state of the post-colonial subject, where he or she cannot feel at home. All right? Okay. Alienation. Okay, it's it's the overlap. The overlap. Alienation too is a psychological state, but alienation is more um, in terms of in terms of cultural displacement. Okay, whereas unhomeliness is more of psychological displacement, but links to culture. So I accept that they overlap. Okay. Um, then we have so 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 unhomeliness usually leads to leads to um, double consciousness, double consciousness. Double consciousness. And it usually leads to the individual being a psychological refugee. Psychological refugee. Being a psychological refugee. Double consciousness is psychological hybridity. Double consciousness is a psychological hybridity. Where they, where they, where the postcolonial subjects has imbibed 
two opposing cultural values. What a psychological subject has imbibed two opposing psychological values and is conscious of them at the same time. And is conscious of them at the same time. The postcolonial subject is conscious of two cultures. He is an embodiment of two cultures in double consciousness. An embodiment of two cultures. One, his native culture, and second, the colonizer's culture. And that is why the, the postcolonial subject is psychologically conflicted. Okay, they are highly disturbed beings, right? So the personal subject is highly disturbed. It's a highly disturbed individual. There's something inherently damaged in his, in his um, psychological constitution, in his um, ontological being. And double consciousness is also the state of the exiled. Instead of the exiled. Remember that the personal subject is perpetually in exile. The personal subject is perpetually in exile. That means it's not always at home. Is not always at home. So exile marks the condition of the personal subject. He always wants to leave. Always wants to leave. Always wants to leave. Maybe he wants to leave the village to the city. He wants to leave the country altogether. To another today, to the metropolis, the center of culture, is never a tomb. So exile marks the condition of the postcolonial subject, and sometimes exile can also be psychological. It's been staying at home, but not living at home in the mind. Let us look at ab abrogation and appropriation. abrogation and appropriation. Again, you can use this as a topic if you want to do a postcolonial study. You can simply say, I want to study abrogation and appropriation in this text. Instead of just saying postcolonialism, postcolonialism, and we don't know exactly what you're talking about. Okay? Abrogation and appropriation. Abrogation can be understood at the level of culture. It can also be understood at the level of language. But it begins at the level of language. Abrogation can be understood at the level of culture. It can also be understood at the level of language. But its primary position is the level of language. It begins from the level of language. And then we can use it to talk about other areas, other spheres. Okay? So abrogation is a term used to describe the act of 
deliberately ignoring the standard rules of the colonizer's language. Abrogation is a term used to describe the act of deliberately ignoring breaking the standard rules, subverting the standard rules of the organizer's language as a form of resistance. A form of resistance. A form of resistance. A form of resistance. Appropriation is linked to abrogation. And refers to the act of altering, shaping, changing or reshaping the colonizer's language in such a way as to in such a way as to suit the purposes of the colonized. The act of changing, altering, shaping, reshaping the colonizer's language to suit the purpose of the colonized or the purpose for, uh, for which the colonized wants to use the language. That is appropriation. The two terms are related, but you need to note the difference. Abrogation implies breaking, deliberately breaking the rules of the colonizer's language as a means of resistance, refusing to obey the standard rules of the colonizer's language is abrogation. But in appropriation, the breaking of these rules is necessary so as to shape the language to fit the purposes for which the, colon uh, the colonizer wants to use the language. There are different terms, but they are related. Okay? So you can appropriate the language of the colonizer because you want to use it in, only in ways that works for you. But to do that, you need to abrogate. You need to ignore some of their rules. Why can somebody say, come and say you should not end a sentence with a preposition? And you say, I don't care. I'm going to end it anyway. <laughs> All right, and that is how we have had um, the various Englishes in the world today. It is a mark of post-colonial resistance, including Nigerian English, so that we speak the language and the white man comes back to learn the language that they gave to us. All right. And we use it to, to write our literature, to exp express our experiences, okay? As seen in pidgin and other forms of um, appropriation of the language in our space today. So it's not only language that is appropriated, culture can be appropriated. It's not, it's, not, it's not only language that can be appropriated, culture can also be appropriated. The colonized have been known to appropriate the colonizer's culture. 
The colonized have been known to appropriate the colonizer's culture. That means take some aspects of the culture, change them, and make them theirs. Use their materials and make our own clothes with it. Okay? That's appropriation. Maybe they made the weapon, but we don't use it to make what they used to make. We used to make what we like. That's appropriation. What suits us? That's appropriation. Take the material that they gave us, maybe in, in dress form, and then make our own dress, our own African dress with it. That's appropriation. That's how appropriation works. Okay. So let us move on. So if you are talking about um, appropriation and abrogation, you can talk about it primarily at the level of language. And note that the postcolonial novel, the postcolonial novel, the postcolonial literature thrives on what? Appropriation and abrogation. So if you want to discuss the language of the postcolonial literature, please talk about it. Begin the discussion by looking at, talking about abrogation and what? And appropriation. And you will be a good student of postcolonial literature. Okay? And postcolonial criticism. Then, abrogation and appropriation has other uh, features. Or abrogation and appropriation have other features. You look at them as two. Like transliteration. Transliteration is a, it's, it's a, a manifestation of abrogation and appropriation. Okay? Chino Achebe in Things Fall Apart abrogates and appropriates the language of the colonial masters, the language of the colonizers. That's why when you read a novel, it is not Queen's English. It's not writing using Queen's English. And one of the things that make the language to have that texture is what? Transliteration. All right? Transliteration. And what is transliteration? Transliteration is the act of... Translation is the act of... Directly... Importing words, structure, and meaning from a source language to a target language from a source language to a target language. From a source language to a target language. From the language of the colonized to the language of the colonizer. So, for instance, if you say, if um, um, translation works, transliteration works in this expression, um, in, uh, by Nigerians, when they say, I am coming, while they are going to wherever they are going, they simply mean that they'll be coming back. All right? Instead of saying, I'll be right back, BRB, it says, I'm coming. Right, but the person is going. That's transliteration because that's how the person says it in his indigenous language. Right? <laughs> Liminality. Liminality. 
Liminality. Liminality. Liminality defines the state of the postcolonial subject. So after this lecture, you can study postcolonialism as much as you want because you know at least the terms that you should use in the specific discussion of a text. Okay, not just saying postcolonialism. Liminality. Liminality defines the position of the postcolonial subject. It is a state of in betweenness. The state of in betweenness. Liminality refers to a state of in betweenness, usually experienced by the post by the colonial subject. A state of in betweenness. In betweenness. Instead of um, being neither here nor there. So when you look at it in psychological terms, you can imagine how serious it is to be in a state of in betweenness. Okay? You're always standing on the threshold of the culture, neither there here nor there. That is the state of the post colonial subject. I was in a liminal state. Then, another term usually studied in postcolonial literature is identity or identity crisis. Identity or identity crisis. One of the themes of postcolonial literature is the theme of identity. Who is the individual? Who is the hero? So, and it is usually studied in terms of crisis of identity. Crisis of identity because the postcolonial subject has identity crisis, identity problem. Being so exposed to different cultures at the same time. He will not know who he is. Is he black? Is he white? All right? Like our friend Tundi. Whether he's French, whether he's African. So then the crisis is a major theme in post colonial literature. Let's look at the colonial subject. The colonial subject. The colonial subject. You can call him the colonial subject or the post-colonial subject. All right? <clears throat> it's a term that we normally use to talk about the colonized. Especially in his subordinated position. Especially in his subordinated position. His position as an underdog. His position as oppressed. His position as a victim. His position as the victimized. That is the colonial subject. Can also also call him the post-colonial subject. So, in case you come across the term the colonial subject that we have been using or the post-colonial subject, that's exactly what we are talking about. Otherness. Or authority. Otherness or authority. Otherness or authority.
Right. So, other news is how the postcolonial subject is viewed in relation to the colonizer. Other news is how the colonial subject is viewed in relation to the colonizer. The term otherness is usually contradicted with selfhood. With selfhood. Selfhood. It is a term drawn from Buddhism. The term drawn from Buddhism, but has been appropriated in postcolonial studies. Selfhood or self is a state of harmony. In Buddhism, when an individual has attained a state of spiritual harmony, okay, has reconciled with the divine, lives in ha uh, harmony with the divine, that's self. But otherness is a divided self. Otherness is a, uh, is a max. It's a term that marks a divided self, and is used to dis describe the colonial subject, because for one, he is culturally displaced, and two, he is in a subordinated position in relation to the colonizer. He is looked down upon. He is undesired, unwanted, despised, hated. And this is what otherness stands for. Otherness is the despised. Otherness marks the despised. Otherness is outside the self. Otherness is expulsion from self. Otherness is expulsion from self. Otherness is outside the self. So at the end of the day, you love yourself more than the other person. That's how you're going to look at it. The self is you. But in, in personal terms, the self is the colonizer. Because it is the loved is the wanted, the desired. The person we want to be like, but the other is outside ourselves. It represents the colonized, the African, the black, the woman. In any discourse, depending on the kind of discourse you're talking about, the child can be uh, the other when you're comparing him to the adult. The black can be the other when you're comparing him to white. The woman can be other when you compare him to men. So the otherness is the despised. The other is the despised, is the hated, is the unwanted, is the undesired, is the unloved, is the expelled. So in postcolonial terms, the black person, the African person, is the other. Okay? His position is that of authority, which is otherness. So authority marks otherness. <laughs>